Hi, I'm all dressed up because I was out celebrating my, my eighth graders uh, promotion at a drive through ceremony at our middle school. It was wonderful. Anyway, we're here because we got to get started on our summer reading. I picked this book from the list, the summer reading list of Baton Rouge High. It's um, called One of Us is Lying, and it's by Karen McManus. Baton Rouge High summer reading list, there's two of them actually. One is a list of nonfiction books, and one's a list of fiction books, and they're asking that you read one from each list. Um, the book I've chosen, again, from the fiction list is One of Us is Lying by Karen McManus. So, you can read along with me. I'll be your friendly audio reader. And, or, you could pick up a copy from your local library. That's what I did. I borrowed this from the library. I called them, checked out the book, drove up to the book, uh, library, and they brought it out to my car for me with gloves and masks on. Um, but you can do the same thing. Or you can uh, purchase the book. I guess you can order it from Amazon or something like that. Um, have it delivered. Um, in the meanwhile, you can follow along with me. You're going to need a pen, notebook, and I've got my bookmark here to keep, keep play, my place. Okay, the notebook is for recording uh, your objective summary, um, making a list of interesting or unknown words, and for creating a deeper thinking question. So those are the things we're going to be writing over here. Our notebook is going to help us in our analyzing the literature. Okay? Let me read a little bit about the book for you on the inside cover. Pay close attention and you might solve this. On Monday afternoon, five students at Bayview High walk into detention. Bronin, the brain, is Yale-bound and never breaks a rule. Addie, the beauty, is the picture-perfect homecoming princess. Nate, the criminal, is already on probation for dealing. Cooper, the athlete, is the all-star baseball picture, pitcher. And Simon, the outcast, is the creator of Bayview High's notorious gossip app. Only Simon never makes it out of that classroom. Before the end of the tent of detention, Simon's dead. And according to investigators, his death wasn't an accident. On Monday, he died. But on Tuesday, he planned to post juicy reveals about all four of his high-profile classmates, which makes all four of them suspects in his murder. Or are they just the perfect patsies for a killer who's still on the loose? Everyone has secrets, right? What really matters is how far you would go to protect them. Ooh, let's see. Again, this book is a work of fiction. The names, characters, places, and incidents either are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead, events or locales is entirely coincidental. Part 1. Simon Says. Chapter 1. Okay, Bronwyn. Monday, September 24th, 2.55 p.m. Sex t a sex tape, a pregnancy scare, two cheating scandals, and that's just this week's update. If all you knew of Bayview High was Simon Ke Kelleher's gossip app, you'd wonder how anyone found time to go to class. Old news, Bronwyn says a voice over my shoulder. Wait till you see tomorrow's post. Damn, I hate getting caught reading about that, especially by its creator. I lower my phone and slam my locker shut. Whose lives are you ruining next, Simon? 
Simon falls into step behind me as I move against the flow of students heading for the exit. It's a public service, he said, with a dismissive wave. You tutor Reggie Crawley, don't you? Wouldn't you rather know he has a camera in his bedroom? I don't bother ask, answering. Me getting anywhere near the bedroom of perpetual stoner Reggie Crawley is about as likely as Simon growing a conscience. Anyway, they bring it on themselves. If people didn't lie and cheat, I'd be out of business. Simon's cold blue eyes take in my lengthening strides. Where are you rushing off to? Covering yourself in extracurricular glory? I wish, as if to taunt me, an alert crosses my phone. Mathlete practice, 3 p.m., epic coffee, followed by a text from one of my teammates. Evan's here. Of course he is. The cute mathlete, less of an oxymoron than you might think, seems to only ever show up when I can't. Oxymoron, that's an interesting sounding word. I'm going to write that down. Oxymoron, O-X-Y-M-O-R-O-N. And you know, you can pause the tape at any time. And the recording, I mean, the video, and then come back. Okay? Back to the story. Not exactly, I say. As a general rule, and especially lately, I try to give Simon as little information as possible. We push through green metal doors to the back stairwell, a dividing line between the dinginess of the original Bayview High and its bright, airy, new wing. Every year, more wealthy families get priced out of San Diego and come 15 miles east to Bayview, expecting that their tax dollars will buy them a nicer school experience than popcorn ceilings and scarred linoleum. Okay, well, we just found out something interesting about the setting. Um, they mentioned San Diego. Bayview is 15 miles east of San Diego. So that means it's in California. So, make a note here, setting, high school, in California, Southern California to be exact. Even though we know that this is a fiction story, it's still set in Southern California. All right. Simon's still on my heels when I reach Mr. Avery's lab on the third floor, and I half turn with my arms crossed. Don't you have some place to be? Yeah, detention, Simon says, and waits for me to keep walking. When I grasp the knob instead, he bursts out laughing. You're kidding me. You too? <laughs> What's your crime? I'm wrongfully accused, I mutter and yank the door open. Three other students are already seated, and I pause to take them in. Not the group I would have predicted, except one. Nate McCauley tips his chair back and smirks at me. You make a wrong turn? This is detention, not student council. He should know. Nate's been in trouble since fifth grade, which is right around the time we last spoke. The gossip mill tells me he's on probation with Bayview's finest for something. It might be a DUI. It might be drug dealing. He's a notorious supplier, but my knowledge is purely theoretical. Notorious. That's an interesting sounding word. Notorious. N-O-T-O-R-I-O-U-S and theoretical, theoretical, T-H-E-O-R-E-T-I-C-A-L, okay? Our interesting word list is growing. Back to the story. Save the commentary 
Mr. Avery checks something off on a clipboard and closes the door behind Simon. High arched windows lining the back wall send triangles of afternoon sun splashing across the floor and faint sounds of football practice float from the field behind the parking lot below. I take a seat as Cooper Clay, who's palming a crumpled piece of paper like a baseball, whispers, Heads up, Addie, and tosses it toward the girl across from him. Addie Prentice blinks, smiles uncertainly, and lets the ball drop to the floor. The classroom clock inches toward three, and I follow its progress with a helpless feeling of injustice. I shouldn't even be here. I should be at Epic Coffee flirting awkwardly with Evan Neiman over differential equations. Mr. Avery is a give it is a give detention first, ask questions never kind of guy, but maybe there's still time to change his mind. I clear my throat and start to raise my hand until I notice Nate's smirk broadening. Mr. Avery, that wasn't my phone you found. I don't know how it got into my bag. This is mine, I say, brandishing my iPhone in its melon-striped case. Honestly, you'd have to be clueless to bring a phone to Mr. Avery's lab. He has a strict no-phone policy and spends the first ten minutes of every class rooting through backpacks like he's head of airline security and we're all on the watch list. My phone was in my locker, like always. You too? Addie turns to me so quickly. Her blonde, shampooed hair swirls around her shoulders. She must have been surgically removed from her boyfriend in order to show up alone. That wasn't my phone either. Me three, Cooper chimes in. His southern accent makes it sound like thry. He and Andy exchange surprised looks, and I wonder how this is news to them when they part when they're part of the same click. Click. You would think that that would be spelled C-L-I-C-K, but it isn't. Click. C-L-I-Q-E. They're part of the same click. Maybe uber popular people have better things to talk about than unfair detentions. Somebody punked us, Simon leans forward with his elbows on the desk, looking spring-loaded and ready to pounce on fresh gossip. His gaze darts over all four of us, clustered in the middle of the otherwise empty classroom, before settling on Nate. Why would anybody want to trap a bunch of students with mostly spotless records in detention? Seems like the sort of thing that, oh, I don't know, a guy who's here all the time might do for fun. I look at Nate, but can't picture it. Rigging detention sounds like work, and everything about Nate, from his messy dark hair to his ratty leather jacket, screams, can't be bothered. Or yawns, yawns it, maybe. He meets my eyes, but doesn't say a word, just tips his chair back even farther. Another millimeter, and he'll fall right over. Cooper sits up straighter, a frown crossing his Captain America face. Hang on, I thought this was just a mix-up, but if the same thing happened to all of us, it's somebody's stupid idea of a prank. And I'm missing baseball practice because of it. He says it like he's a heart surgeon being detained from a life-saving operation. Mr. Avery rolls his eyes. Save the conspiracy theories for another teacher. I'm not buying it. You all know the rules against bringing phones to class, and you broke them. He gives Simon an especially sour glance. Teachers know about that exists, but there's not much they can do to stop it. Simon only uses initials to identify people and never talks openly about school. Now listen up. You're here until four. I want each of you to write a 500-word essay on how technology is ruining American high schools. Anyone who can't follow the rules gets another detention tomorrow. What do we write with? Addie asks, 
There aren't any computers here. Most classrooms have Chromebooks, but Mr. Avery, who looks like he should have retired a decade ago, is a holdout. Mr. Avery crosses to Addie's desk and taps the corner of a lined yellow notepad. We all have one. Explore the magic of longhand writing. It's a lost art. Addie's pretty heart-shaped face is a mask of confusion. But how do we know when we've reached 500 words? Count, Mr. Ravy replies. His eyes drop to the phone I'm still holding and hand that over, Miss Rojas. Doesn't the fact that you're confiscating my phone twice give you pause? Who has two phones, I ask. Nate grins so quick I almost miss it. Seriously, Mr. Avery, somebody was playing a joke on us. Mr. Avery's snowy mustache twitches in annoyance, and he extends his hand with a beckoning motion. Phone, Miss Rojas. Unless you want to return visit, I'll give it over with a sigh as he looks disapprovingly at the others. So now we find here that who he's talking to is Miss Rojas. Again, I say, he says, phone Miss Rojas, unless you want to return visit. I give it over with a sigh as he looks disapprovingly at the others. So we know there when she uses the the word I, that that is the first person narrative. Okay, and we also find out that the narrator is a young lady named Miss Rojas. Okay. Moving on. The phones I took from the rest of you earlier are in my desk. You'll get them back after detention. Addie and Cooper exchange amused glances, probably because their actual phones are safe in their backpacks. Mr. Avery tosses my phone into a drawer and sits behind the teacher's desk, opening a book as he prepares to ignore us for the next hour. I pull out a pen tap it against my yellow notepad, and contemplate the assignment. Contemplate. That's a nice word. I'm going to write that down. Contemplate. C-O-N-T-E-M-P-L-A-T-E. Okay. Does Mr. Avery really believe technology is ruining schools? That's a pretty sweeping statement to make over a few contraband phones. Ooh, contraband. Let's add that to the list. Contraband. C-O-N-T-R-A-B-A-N-D. Maybe it's a trap, and he's looking for us to contradict him instead of agree. I glance at Nate, who's bent over his notepad, writing, Computers suck over and over in block letters. It's possible I'm overthinking this. All right, that ends that first section, and we're gonna make a note of that. That is called, well, the chapters are not listed at, with numbers. So chap, the first chapter, chapter one, well, actually, it does say chapter one, but it's split up into subsections. So the first section is called Bronwyn. Okay. These are names of the students who've been given detention. Now, the second section in chapter one. Let's begin. It's called Cooper. Monday, September 24th, 3.05 p.m. My hand hurts within minutes, 
It's pathetic, I guess, but I can't remember the last time I wrote anything longhand. Plus, I'm using my right hand, which never feels natural, no matter how many years I've done it. My father insisted I learn to write right-handed in second grade after he first saw me pitch. Your left arm's gold, he told me. Don't waste it on crap that don't matter, which is anything but pitching as far as he's concerned. That was when he started calling me Cooperstown, like the Baseball Hall of Fame. Nothing like putting a little pressure on an eight-year-old. Simon reaches for his backpack and roots around, unzipping every section. He hoists it onto his lap and peers inside. Where the hell's my water bottle? No talking, Mr. Kelleher, Mr. Avery says without looking up. I know, but my water bottle's missing and I'm thirsty. Mr. Avery points toward the sink at the back of the room. It's counter crowded with beakers and petri dishes. Get yourself a drink, quietly. Simon gets up and grabs a cup from a stack on the counter, filling it with water from the tap. He heads back to his seat and puts the cup on his desk, but seems distracted by Nate's methodical writing. Dude, he says, kicking his sneaker against the leg of Nate's death desk. Seriously, did you put those phones in our backpacks to mess with us? Now Mr. Avery looks up, frowning. I said quietly, Mr. Kelleher. Nate leans back and crosses his arms. Why would I do that? Simon shrugs. Why do you do anything? So you'll have company for whatever your screw-up of the day was. One more word out of either of you and his detention tomorrow, Mr. Avery warns. Simon opens his mouth anyway, but before he can speak, there's the sound of tires squealing and then the crash of two cars hitting each other. Addie gasps and I brace myself against my desk like somebody just rear-ended me. Nate, who looks glad for the interruption, is the first on his feet toward the window. Who gets into a fender bender in the school parking lot, he asks. Brahman looks at Mr. Avery like she's asking for permission. And when he gets up from his desk, she heads for the window as well. Addie follows her, and I finally unfold myself from my seat. Okay, to be clear, Bronwyn is Miss Rojas. Okay, that was written from her perspective. And we know her last name because that's what the teacher who's having detention called her. The person speaking now in the first person, first person narrative point of view, is Cooper. Okay, so this is this this is um the way the story is uh, the struck the story is structured. Apparently, from first person narrative, section by section, um, with with each narrative being one of the students who is in detention, supposedly for having a phone. But they're saying that the phones that were confiscated, they weren't their phones. Someone planted phones on them. Let's see what happens. Two cars, an old red one, and one... Let me back up a little bit. Bronwyn looks at Mr. Avery like she's asking for permission, and when he gets up from his desk, she heads for the window as well. Addie follows her, and I finally unfold myself from my seat. Might as well see what's going on. I lean against the ledge to look outside, and Simon comes up behind me with a disparaging laugh as he surveys the scene below. Disparaging. Disparaging. D I S P A R A G I N G. Disparaging. Two cars, an old red one and a nondescript gray one, are smashed into each other at a right angle. We all stare at them in silence until Mr. Avery lets out an exasperated sigh. I better make sure no one was hurt. He runs his eyes over all of us and zeroes in on Bronwyn as the most responsible of the bunch. 
Miss Rojas, keep this room contained until I get back. Okay, Bronwyn says, casting a nervous glance toward Nate. We stay at the window, watching the scene below, but before Mr. Ravy or another teacher appears outside, both cars start their engines and drive out of the parking lot. Well, that was anticlimactic, Simon says. Ooh, anticlimactic. Anticlimactic. A-N-T-I-C-L-I-N. A-N-T-I-C-L-I-N. M-A-C-T-I-C, anti-climactic. He heads back to his desk and picks up his cup, but instead of sitting, he wanders to the front of the room and scans the periodic table of elements poster. He leans out into the hallway like he's about to leave, but then he turns and raises his cup like he's toasting us. Anyone else want some water? I do, Addie says, slipping into her chair. Get it yourself, Princess, Simon smirks. Addie rolls her eyes and stays put while Simon leans against Mr. Avery's desk. Literally, huh? What do you do with yourself now that homecoming's over? Big gap between now and senior prom.